Uh, thank you for the uh, warm welcome there, Andrew. I couldn't say it better if I uh, wrote it myself. Um, so my name is Steve Clark, and uh, Mike and I are here to present on our paper, which is uh, concerning retrofit for some flood management measures that uh, we designed for um, the city of Bayside over 2016-2017. So yeah, as I sort of just said, um, our uh, report was on a case study, or sorry, this presentation, a uh, case study for a uh, retrofit of some flood management measures that we put together for the city of Bayside uh, across 2016-2017 and just a brief syllabus of what we'll be talking about. Uh, we're gonna go over sort of the, the issues that we were commissioned to, to look at, uh, the identified causes that we sort of uh, saw, um, how we investigated which causes were most likely, the options we then pursued, how we staged those options, and then uh, just a brief sort of overview of the centralized storages for this catchment, um, the opportunities, barriers, the applications sort of across Melbourne and, uh, and uh, Australia as a whole. So the issue that we were commissioned to look at concerned a uh, relatively small catchment, uh, about 20 kilometers south of the CBD, uh, Melbourne CBD that is. Um, it's built about 1971, I think, and it's serviced by a pit pipe system that was put in relatively the same, same time frame. Um, in the last sort of five to ten years, local residents have been reporting on uh, multi-annual nuisance flooding events, and a couple of lower probabilities, high intensity storms have come through and, and caused some damage as well as uh, flooding of properties. <coughs> the catchment itself sort of, as with most sort of city of Bayside, is relatively flat, but characterized by these trapped depressions, and the pit and pipe system that was put in place was really, you know, designed to service drainage um, of those, those those trap depressions. So in this case, that's really what we're dealing with is a, uh, a trap depression that for some reason is not draining appropriately. And, uh, yeah. So with the, the rise in property values across Melbourne uh, over the years, as well as uh, this being a fairly desirable suburb in the south, there's been a real push for infill development that infill development has actually sort of gradually over the decades uh, increased the impervious footprint of, of the uh, residences. So, the, uh, I guess the other point to sort of really touch on is the flood frequency patterns and, and how we do hydrology has also shifted in sort of that almost 50 years since it was designed and, and constructed. And um, I guess the final point is, you know, City Bayside is relatively large and they do have, you know, a fairly large number of kilometers of, of infrastructure to look after, so that's sort of the the overall issue associated with this catchment, and I guess, I hope that, or I don't hope, but I guess some of you uh, will be able to relate. This is just a couple of photos showing um, the uh, two different, or sorry, showing the lower probability and higher intensity events. Um, we don't really have any photographic evidence of the nuisance flooding, unfortunately, but uh, just in conversation with local residents, they sort of said that the nuisance flooding was really just a matter of it would come up to the uh, the edge of their property, and then those lower prob uh, lower probability ones were were really flooding out. So just looking at it, there was no you know when we walked across all the pits and, and looked inside of them, there was no evident cause that was immediately evident that. It just with respect to failure of the drainage. Um, when we received the spatial data set from council, we looked at it and we sort of said, okay, well, it ties into a Melbourne water drain. So you can, uh, don't know about the laser pointer or not. Anyway, as you can see sort of in the uh, bottom right photo there, um, we said to ourselves, okay, well, it ties into that. So there's either insufficient drainage or there's something wrong with it. So the first thing that we did was we said, let's get some CCTV done, take a look at what's in the pipes themselves, and whether or not the issue is just a matter of insufficient conveyance. And what we saw was uh, just basically four pipes for all the pipes. They were um, not necessarily you know, uh, compromised as, as much as they were really, really plugged up. Um, we had 
fine, um, fine root broke through a lot of the joints that was causing about 70 to 100% blockage. And in this picture here, you can actually see I think we've counted about 15 uh, tennis balls from the park next door where people were throwing them for the dog. Um, and so we started to identify possible causes based on that CCTV. First thing we said was, okay, well, potentially it is some you know, the aging infrastructure and um, climate change, and it's just you know, insufficient for the, uh, the change in patterns. But that poor hydraulic, you know, the poor drainage hydraulics is also almost certainly going to be the number one issue. And as you can sort of see by the, the root mass in there, they're not doing sufficient root cutting. So the maintenance regime of just using pressurized blowout is probably not enough. And then, um, the, you know, I guess the final one that you can't really ignore is that the Melbourne water drain during a uh, storm event will most likely be full, as the boundary conditions will have to be that you know, tail water is fixed at a full pipe. Um, so, based on that sort of causality that we established or that we identified, we then proceeded to undertake an existing conditions model uh, just to investigate those causes and identify which ones it potentially was. Um, it's one of those things where we had to kind of juggle calibrating the model and also, you know, recognizing these, this host of potential causes that were, um, that were responsible for it. Um, we built it using the spatial, spatial data for council, and then essentially what we did is uh, we took every single potential cause that we identified, ran them individually, and then we ran it as a holistic model with all of them failing at the same time. And then stripping back, we were able to identify, um, you know, or we were able to, to match and calibrate to those two storm events, the anecdotal uh, storm events of, to the property line, and then the lower uh, uh, exceedance probability events that were actually flooding the local uh, properties. And what we found was that the results of that uh, indicated that flooding was primarily caused by reduced conveyance and tailwater conditions. And I guess the point that we should have also pointed out in the previous slide is that when we did the CCTV, sorry, CCTV, at the joints you could see that there was quite a bit of failure in the joints, which indicated to us that there was significant surcharge in, in the pipe region. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was sort of a one indicator that I forgot to touch on. Um, Based on that, we then produced a couple of flood models, and these are just a couple of gifts that I put together to sort of show the flood propagation through the area. You can see that to the south it is quite, um, quite trapped, that depression. The left one being the anecdotal um, flooding, and then the right one being the um, lower probability flooding events. We didn't have any sort of um, tipping bucket data or any sort of hydrographs for these, for these storm events that we were looking at. So we, in conversation with the city of Bayside, decided, well, nuisance flooding we would establish as being you know, your one exceedance per year annual exceedance probability, and then your you know, the more uh, damaging, less probable one would most likely be one to an 18 to 20% uh, annual exceedance probability event. So essentially, one year, five year. Based on the results of that, uh, entered into sort of a dialogue with City of Bayside uh, with respect to what potential options were available, what space we could potentially use, um, what budgets they were looking at, um, and we essentially went through an options analysis with them. Um, we took those options and we, we looked at them in, in terms of cost-benefit analysis, and then based on opportunity to implement them, we added them essentially into our model, into our existing conditions calibrated model, and looked at the impact or the, the flood redu reduction impacts that they provided. Um, it's sorry, sort of sad to say, but uh, we did not result in a silver bullet solution off of that. Um, and the goalposts kind of moved on us a little bit. Um, so essentially, we had, came to a point where the situation was far more complex than originally sort of scoped. Um, our, you know, our studies and our, our mitigated flood modeling indicated that it was achievable, but it was going to cost quite a bit. Um, 
and so we sort of decided that we would we would approach it with a, uh, a sort of staged approach, and that staged approach would be decided in, in liaison with the city of Bayside, recognizing that because of local um, services in the area and and what what area we had available for construction, that uh, pipe storage would most likely be the most ideal um, solution for immediate benefit. And so our staged approach really um, centered on the fact that one solution wasn't going to cut it for everything. And uh, in, in conversation with City Base, I decided that stage one would focus on alleviating the nuisance flooding that was being reported by uh, local residents with the goal of taking the one year off the roads and uh, under, underground. And then that stage two would essentially serve the role of taking the five year off the roads uh, and maintaining the 100 year uh, in the road reserve and just restoring that sort of level of service over a number of years as opposed to uh, sort of instantaneously. Um, those two photos just sort of show that stage one was downstream of the uh, downstream of that, that uh, flooding issue and stage two corresponded to both downstream and upstream options, mostly pipe storage but then also with uh, decentralized storages. And I'll hand over to Mike to talk on that. Thanks, Steve. So, effectively, what are we talking about when we're talking about decentralized storages? We've got uh, retaining basins, above ground water bodies. Uh, we've got uh, underground stormwater harvesting or uh, detention. And then also rainwater tanks that we can implement on an individual block basis. Within this site, we, uh, we looked at the catchment as a whole and then identified potential opportunities uh, for the stage two of the project. So obviously there's an oval and a couple of recreation uh, reserves in there and the school uh, down to the south. Uh, but effectively both of which um, have potential for stormwater harvesting. However, these options were quickly ruled out at, um, through various means. Uh, for example, the Oval already had a uh, purple pipe system and a stormwater harvesting system um, for its irrigation, and there was limited scope within the um, urbanised catchment to either dig up uh, and use uh, the open spaces as either underground or above ground storages. So effectively, we looked at a thir uh, the third option being rainwater tanks, and then how can we go about mitigating uh, the flood mag magnitude with uh, ra uh, with rainwater tanks in a uh, small localised catchment. So rainwater tanks are effectively a um, common technology, but um, there's a number of opportunities and barriers uh, with respect to flood management that, uh, as a council, we need. Uh, and speaking on council's behalf now. Um, that we would need to really gra uh, grab hold of. And so we would need to obviously consider the appropriateness of the solution, the, effective, the effectiveness that it has in treating the flood management issue, and also the capacity of the rainwater tanks to provide appropriate storage. We would need to understand the local interest in flood management, the community expectations, the level of service that the community expects, and then also the acceptance of uh, a decentralised technology. Really, uh, the council was looking to grab hold of uh, the opportunities that presented itself, uh, whereby uh, the rainwater tanks uh, would include uh, or help uh, develop an integrated water management approach. But then there was also the barriers to, con uh, to be considered as well, being climate change and, that, and what impact that might have on the solution the required policy and planning to implement such a scheme, and lastly, um, possibly most importantly, the economic feasibility and the funding of the, uh, of the scheme. So, looking to, uh, more at the effectiveness and capacity at the moment, um, many urban uh, dwellings uh, already have uh, rainwater tanks. Um, they're a common technology, However, they're not set up for flood management purposes uh, with any respect to, to set something up for a, a flood management or a rainwater tank for a flood management purpose. We need to uh, design airspace within the tank. 
we do this via high and low flow outlets, uh, which allow um, higher flows to be captured in the rainwater tanks during larger storms. But in addition, the, uh, the rainwater tanks would need to be designed on an individual basis, quite simply because the location of the tank uh, would directly impact on how much uh, roof catchment are picked up and then also the pumping uh, requirements and so forth, uh, which impacts on its en energy efficiency. So rainwater tanks are, uh, are already effective in water savings in our uh, urban environment. And, but there are a number of practical steps that council could have uh, can implement with the community to improve uh, with the flood management purposes. For example, they can uh, help uh, households that already have the tanks uh, about simple steps that they can uh, use to uh, effectively retrofit their, uh, their rainwater tanks uh, for this kind of operation. Finally, it's probably important to note um, the Mountain Waters floodplain strategy uh, notes that uh, collecting rainfall uh, where it falls, i.e. in rainwater tanks, uh, can play a role in flood mitigation areas. However, it, uh, it, do it does note within the strategy as well that it will not work in all places and also it requires careful management. So the next part of Council's task was effectively to uh, understand uh, the local interest uh, with it, uh, with respect to flood management, and then also uh, the level of service that one they provide, and also two, the, one uh, what the community expects them to provide. And in this case, uh, it's obviously flood rock waters not been impacting uh, their property. So, as Steve mentioned, uh, this level of service wasn't provided uh, within uh, this case study. Uh, and that was due to a number of, a number of reasons uh, mentioned by Steve. But what we found during the investigation was also that uh, though uh, the re residents were impacted by flooding, there was probably a little bit of wonder in terms of that they didn't quite understand what uh, their flood, well, what was causing their flood management. For example, there was a number of uh, litter and uh, debris in the streets, such as leaves, uh, and so forth. Uh, but it, what that showed is that the streets weren't regularly cleaned and therefore in neighbouring councils uh, such as Kingston when informed residents get uh, well, before large rainfall events or predicted large rainfall events they, um, they request council to come out and uh, and, street, and street clean the, the it shows, because um, they understood the, uh, the effect that the litter can have on the serviceability of their drainage network. So what that also uh, showed Council was that non-structural measures such as education uh, campaign, uh, campaigns can uh, provide a effective flood management tool as well. And in this specific case, um, the uh, flooding was occurring opposite a primary school, so there was an opportunity for Council to work with the school on its curriculum and implement a form of flood management um, information uh, out to the students which can then be taken home to their parents. So focusing on the opportunities that this, pro uh, that this provided, obviously the rainwater tanks or a decentralised storage provides uh, downstream water uh, waterways with improved water quality it promotes non-potable uh, reuse and uh, also uh, decreases the flood magnitude. But what, using the rainwater tanks and the, uh, for a flood management purpose in the existing and urban catchment, uh, it uh, really linked within council and uh, when it's in community uh, that the uh, flood protection as well as uh, water savings, which I'm off. And so, when we focused with Council uh, about the barriers, um, climate change was one of the biggest ones. Uh, Bay uh, Bayside is a low-lying council, coastal council as you well know, uh, so it's very susceptible to um, storm surge, sea level rise. And we looked at the case study that, okay, are we designing a solution that works now, but then in a changed climate, um, 
that is no longer um, suitable. We also worked with our council around their policy and planning and looking at the uh, barriers that uh, would require, or potential barriers uh, for decentralised flood management. What we found that um, these, uh, that their policy and planning structure wasn't a, uh, a barrier, that uh, water tanks uh, don't require a planning permit, provided they're uh, less than 4,500 litres, and they are uh, not classified as a structure, so don't need a building uh, permit either, provided they're on the ground and also uh, free for freestanding. However, what we did find was that by the change in responsibilities from council or Melbourne Water or an authority to a resident, that it changed the requirements for uh, maintenance and the functionality that that now fell in the community as opposed to the you know, to the regular authority uh, agency. So probably, lastly, and uh, potentially the biggest barrier in terms of a um, using rainwater tanks as a um, decentralised storage was uh, the economic feasibility and the funding. So what we wanted to understand was around what, uh, what sort of incentives uh, would be required uh, to implement uh, this sort of technology across the community, uh, whether it would be a cost sharing arrangement, full supply of the tanks, uh, and if that would be enough uh, to get residents interested enough to install <coughs> Uh, these tanks. And then also what about the other costs associated with these tanks uh, such as plumbing into the existing facilities, the maintenance uh, and to ensure the ongoing functionality. So for this case study if we implemented 4,500 litre tanks uh, with a 500 litre airspace per tank uh, which was available for flood storage then if we looked at rainwater tanks alone, we would need approximately a thousand uh, tanks to mitigate the 1% uh, flood. However, these 4,500 litre tanks cost approximately a thousand dollars each, which means it is still a very significant capital investment for flood protection. And so what we were looking at in addition was also other, uh, other storages, including pipe storage and also other options uh, in terms of decentralised technologies. And, uh, potentially the other barrier uh, is that uh, the economic feasibility of rainwater use, uh, as we probably all, work, all well know that some potable water, mains water is pretty cheap, and so studies have found that water prices would actually have to increase by 3 to 16% to provide a positive economic uh, benefit cost um, ratio for rainwater use within the house. And so probably what it comes down to is that, can it work? Uh, are decentralised storages, and in this case, rain, uh, rainwater tanks are potential for flood mitigation tools? The answer is yes. However, uh, large-scale implementation of uh, this is uh, probably unlikely you know, due to uh, economic viability. And then also consideration needs to be given to uh, stakeholders and also future challenges being climate change, population growth, urban development and also ongoing land use change. So to conclude, this case study effectively showed that there was a flood management issue that wasn't uh, easily solved through tradi traditional uh, pit and pipe infrastructure. And so we looked at alternative options uh, and um, used decentralised stuff, flood management. Rain, uh, rainwater tanks and, uh, and other decentralised storages pr uh, provide uh, this alternative option. However, there are obvious barriers to overcome before we can realise the, um, the opportunities that it, that it exists. And that's that, so thank you. Any questions?